1850, a new hat was designed that wasn't just a fashion accessory, it was a social statement. It was actually made by William and James Bowler of Southwark, which is why it became known as a bowler hat. The bowler was quickly adopted by engineers, bankers. In fact, it became the crowning symbol for socially climbing Victorians. School was a harsh place, but it represented the Victorian ideal. First, to know your place in the scheme of things, and second, from there, to aspire to higher things. In other words, to push forward the great engine of society by bettering yourself. At the beginning of Queen Victoria's reign, most children had to work. Like adults, they worked on the land, in factories, and in the mines. Poor people couldn't afford to send their children to school and without education, there was little hope of a better life as an adult. I vaguely thought that school had always been compulsory, but in fact, it wasn't until 1876 that anyone had to go to school, and then it was only till the age of eight. It wasn't until 1899 that 12 year olds had to go to school. Then, of course, everyone got some education, and it also had the advantage you got them out of the factories and the mines. Because as late as 1891, children as young as 10 were working in the mines. So hurrah for school, for getting them out of the factories and the mines. Today, it's not only education that we take for granted, we expect to be able to stay healthy and clean. We expect to eat food that is safe and live in houses with heating and water. But for the early Victorians, life was very different. Most people were very poor, and for them, the climb up the social ladder, even to the middle class, was a distant dream. For poor people, home was like this. In fact, this particular room was home for nine people. It wasn't just cramped, it was dirty too. The issue for them wasn't social climbing, it was basic survival. Houses like this had no running water, no drains, and certainly no sewers. For the people who lived here, disease and death were never far away. For most people, the lavatory was an outside privy, like this one. Essentially, that's just a hole in the ground with a seat over it. And if you were really lucky and you had a pig, you could put the pigsty next door, instant waste disposal. Well, that's fine for the country and the whole family could share this, but if you lived in town, you wouldn't have a pig, you probably wouldn't even have an outside, so you'd have to put your privy in your own cellar. Everything changed when the water closet came along. Simon Kirby here runs Thomas Crapper & Co, one of the most famous water closet companies, started in 1861. Simon, when do you reckon it all began? It really got going around about 1848 with the uh, Health Act of that year, which uh, pretty much insisted that some means of disposal of waste was fitted into every new house. It was either you had to have a water closet or a cesspit, they just basically didn't want people chucking it in the streets or pouring it into the rivers anymore. Right, so that was 1848. And who was the sort of pioneer after that? I think there were many great pioneers at the time, but uh, my favourite, or one of my favourites, is George Jennings, who uh, uh, fitted in the first ever uh, public loose in the Great Exhibition of 1851. Oh, yes, in the Crystal Palace. That's yes. right, and charged a penny for anyone to enter from where we get to the term spend a penny. And this is one of his finest, yes? Yes, I think he was most proud of this. In fact, uh, what he called it, the closet of the century, um, somewhat arrogantly. Um, but it was a very fine piece. It's the first successful siphonic loo, which actually sucked as well as flushed all the contents away. 
Water closets helped to clean up the homes, but they didn't solve the problem because all that sewage had to go somewhere, and that somewhere was straight into the river. The bigger the city, the bigger the problem. And London, whose population had more than doubled between 1800 and 1850, had it worst of all. The great scientist Michael Faraday took a trip on the river in 1855 and was appalled at the smell and the colour of it. He called it a fermenting sewer and he decided to do a scientific experiment to see how bad it really was. So every time they came to a bridge, he took a piece of white card like this and he tore off some pieces about an inch square. And then he moistened them and he dropped them over the side into the river. And he found that before they had sunk an inch, they were out of sight. Well, he reported his results in a letter to the Times, and he predicted there would be real trouble before too long. And he was right. But still, no action was taken for three more years. Things came to a head in the long, hot summer of 1858, when all this sewage began to decompose on these sloping mud banks that the Thames then had. Now, the MPs were very, very proud of their brand new Houses of Parliament, but they found they couldn't breathe. The smell was so disgusting. They soaked all the curtains in the house with chloride of lime to try and soak up the smell, but it didn't work. They were nasally tortured, and even the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Benjamin Disraeli, was seen running from the chamber. They even considered deserting the Houses of Parliament and meeting somewhere else. The terrible smell had become not just a local horror story, but a national issue. But eventually, they debated the great stink in Parliament and they decided to give three million pounds to the Metropolitan Board of Works and tell them to sort it out. Stopping the stink would take the biggest construction project of the entire Victorian era. And the driving force behind it was to be an engineering genius called Joseph Bazalgette. Bazalgette used a revolutionary construction technique. Most of the sewers are built of brick, but between them is not ordinary lime mortar, which was the normal practice, but Portland cement. Portland cement was actually patented in 1824, but it had been used mainly just to face buildings with. That was what the chap who invented it used it for. And Bazalgette reckoned it would be better down here because it sets even underwater and steadily gets harder with time. So all of this is Portland cement. Bazalgette was a man of incredible foresight. He didn't just build a system that would cope with London's needs in the 1850s, but predicted that the city would continue to grow. So he deliberately made the whole system larger than he needed, and it still provides the backbone of London's sewage network today. As people migrated from the countryside into the city, a whole lot of problems developed about food. In the countryside, they'd been growing their own. They knew what it was, they knew where it had come from. But in the city, of course, they didn't have anywhere to grow it, so they had to buy it. That meant they didn't have any control over it. There was going to be a seller and a buyer, and where you have commerce, you have corruption. Many food sellers were on the make. And that meant for the people who were buying the food, all too often, what they wanted was quite different from what they eventually got. Food adulteration was all too common. For example, if you went and bought loose tea like this, it was probably recycled. The flour. Well, this looks lovely and white, doesn't it? Really nice. But it's only nice and white because it's packed with chalk. As for this lovely lump of cheese, it looks great, but if you ask for Gloucester cheese, they would colour it red with red lead. Seriously dangerous. 
Shop assistants often witness the worst crimes. William Luby reported seeing his boss buying candles, melting them down, mixing the molten wax with brown paint, letting it solidify and then selling the bits as chocolate to unsuspecting kids. But even worse, the same man bought the sugar sweepings off the floor of grocers, which were already covered with dirt, full of spiders and flies, and had been peed on by cats and dogs. And he would boil the sugar down and make toffee. Would you like one? Sometimes, even the most delicious looking things contained hidden horrors. In 1881, a sample of ice cream was analysed in London and found to contain cotton fibres, straw, human hair, cat hair, fleas, lice and bedbugs. People wanted food they could trust and manufacturers stepped in to provide it. Quality and consistency were promised by new brand labels, many of which still survive today. And things started to change on the high street as well. New retail chains opened to compete with corner shops. In 1844, the first co-op opened in Rochdale, offering people good, unadulterated food at a fair price. They even offered to share the profits with the customers, an idea that was to spread throughout the industrialised North. And the Victorians also needed health care. Operating this treble-powered dental drill is quite tricky. It seems to take two hands and one foot. Now, being the patient can't have been much fun, but luckily, in 1846, anaesthetics came over. First, ether had been used by a dentist in America and came over here within two months. It was such a brilliant idea. And then the following year, 1847, they started using chloroform, which was better because it didn't catch fire. It was a lot safer to use. So people began to go to the dentist and have their rotten teeth pulled out. And then, of course, they wanted replacements. And the question was, where were they going to get them from? So, Roxanne, where did they get new teeth from? Well, the teeth around that time, in 1850, actually came from human teeth. But didn't they object? Well, at that stage, they didn't have much choice because they were actually dead. <laughs> I mean, you mean they got teeth from corpses? Unfortunately, yes. These are actually made from what was known as Waterloo tea. Waterloo, because a lot of the teeth at that time were taken from soldiers killed in battle. So they actually went round battlegrounds with a pair of pliers? Mm. Ah! An enormously lucrative trade. If you fell ill, there was no NHS or anything like that, and only rich Victorians could afford to pay for a doctor. Ordinary people would come here to the chemists to buy all kinds of cure-alls. One popular drug was perhaps too effective for its own good, opium. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Could I have a pennyworth of your finest, please? Thank you Thank very you much. much sir. Good day Thank to you. you. Getting hold of opium was as simple as that. The trouble was that people were taking it for pain relief, but they had no scientific knowledge about the dangerous side effects, and so they were just taking it on a trial and error basis. There was a lot of error, and it was sometimes deadly. In England alone, between 1836 and 1839, 30 children died when their mothers gave them opium to soothe their teething pains. Opium was taken as a recreational drug too. An estimated five out of six working class families were regular users. And opium wasn't taken only by the working classes. It was widely tolerated, even by the police, because it calmed people down. Alcohol made people aggressive and violent, but opium just made them relaxed and happy. And it also induced amazing visions. It's been suggested that some of the bizarre ideas in Alice in Wonderland were actually inspired by opium-induced hallucinations. Early Victorian pharmacists mixed age-old recipes and potions with no scientific basis. But all that was about to change. 
By the end of the century, a chemical industry had been established and medicines had become much more scientific. The Victorians started a chemical revolution because they made the first ever synthetic drugs. And the most important of them started with this stuff. This is willow bark. And people had been chewing it for thousands of years to get rid of their headaches. Well, chemists eventually discovered that the active principle was stuff called salicylic acid. But it tasted horrible and made people sick. So chemists took to the labs to make it more palatable. Finally, they came up with this, aspirin. The most widely used drug ever. Today, the world swallows a million aspirin tablets every hour. One of the most important things the Victorians ever did for us. By the end of Victoria's reign, living conditions for ordinary people had been transformed. Working-class housing was far from perfect, but at least the cities offered sanitation and running water. At the same time, a new, educated middle class had arrived. Window-shopping consumers who were upwardly mobile. And at the very top stood an elite of nouveau riche, bankers, engineers and industrialists, living proof that ordinary people could amass fortunes that rivaled those of the aristocracy. If you had money, the great thing was to flaunt it, to show what a man of the world you were by displaying every trophy you had. These Victorians were always keen to keep ahead of the Joneses, and what better way to impress your friends than through an expensive pastime? Billiards was very popular with the Victorians. Oh. People had been knocking balls around on tables for ages, but it wasn't until they had rubber that they could make really good bouncy cushions. So this sort of table only became available about 1850. The trouble was it was very expensive in elephants. They made billiard balls out of ivory, and by 1864 they were having to shoot 8,000 elephants every year just to supply billiard balls for the English. Luckily, in 1869, John and Isaiah Hyatt came up with a brand new plastic called celluloid, and they were able to use that to make billiard balls. It did occasionally explode when you hit them too hard, but it was very good stuff, good news for the players, and very good news for the elephants. But if you really want to see the high technology in a Victorian household, the place to come is the kitchen. The point is, it's a huge household. There are probably 10 children and even more servants. And so there's a mass of work to be done here in the kitchen. So they would need every labor-saving device they could possibly lay their hands on. And look at this one. It says, time and labor saved. This is, of course, a knife sharpening machine. A lemon squeezer to make the gin and tonic. The parsley chopper. I've got one of these. This is the nutmeg grater and a sugar snipper. You get your sugar in huge great bars and you have to snip bits off for the mistress's tea. And of course, an early food processor for making that gigantic omelet. But perhaps the most desirable kitchen gadget of all was the fridge. We're going to the conservatory, the hottest room in the house, to see whether a Victorian fridge can keep cool. I've challenged John Missenden, a professor of refrigeration, to get it to work. Wonderful. Finished. What are these boxes? Well, essentially, they're, as you can see, they're two Victorian commodes connected by the parish pump. Now, is this your original design? This is the Jacob Perkins design from 1857. The very first. Oh, really? So, should I pump then to get please it working? Please do, please do. I'd okay. ra rather you than me. And how does it work? Well, it works like your fridge at home, exactly the same principle. The cold box and the hot box. Okay. And essentially, we're pumping the heat out of here okay. into here. I mean, this is heat going up these pipes. And that's heat going up those pipes in the vapour. What sort of vapour? Ether. Inside the cooling box, the ether in the pipes expands and absorbs the surrounding heat, so lowering the temperature of this water. The pump 
then drives the ether along the pipes to release its heat on the other side. And did these catch on? They didn't. Ah. For the very reason that you see now, that you have to do that 24 hours a day, day and night. Let's see if it works. Mm. What's your temperature in there? About 40 degrees centigrade. 40. Well, mine is 20, 26. Well, it is working. It's working. It's only going to take two days to get an ice cube, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. That's fantastic. Technology invaded every room in the house, but my favourite gadgets are in the bathroom. At the Great Exhibition in 1851, in the soap and perfumery department, there were no less than 727 exhibitors. And two years later, 1853, William Gladstone reduced the tax on soap from 50% to nothing, so soap became cheap and desirable. However, the great technological advance that I love best came later in the 1890s, in shaving. Now, most people were still shaving with terrifying cutthroat razors like this, which I wouldn't dare use. The safety razor had been invented, but wasn't yet a great success. Until the spring of 1895, when a chap with the unlikely name of King Camp Gillette invented an entirely new system. And this was it, the disposable razor blade. Because up till then, it was very difficult. You had to resharpen your razor frequently. This was the first time ever that somebody had made something to be disposable, to be thrown away. And it was a fantastic success. It changed, well, the way we think about the world. We now have disposable razors, disposable pens, all sorts of disposable things. But this was the first, the razor blade King Camp Gillette. 1895. In their unending search for self-improvement, for health and cleanliness, the Victorians patented hundreds of thousands of inventions. But for me, there's one clean winner. For the young, upwardly mobile Victorian gentleman, this was the ultimate status symbol, the Velocipede Shower. Hard work and technology are the buzzwords next on UK TV History. It's how the Empire was born and what the Victorians did for us.